These are the notes on inverse fo functions. The first thing we're going to look at is the notation. The inverse of f of x is denoted with a little negative 1 up in the spot where an exponent would go, f inverse of x. The negative 1 is not an exponent, it's just how we write it. Graphically, what this means is the inverse of f of x is a reflection of f of x over the line y equals x. If we remember from geometry, if we have an xy axis, then the line y equals x would be the diagonal line going right through the origin with the slope of 1. If we want to reflect a point over the line y equals x, what will happen is the x and y values will switch places and the point 3, 0 would become the point 0, 3 when I do that reflection. Whatever distance I have going up, the distance going across would have to be the same distance in a reflection. What this means numerically is if f of a is equal to b, then f inverse of b is equal to a. In other words, if x is a and b is y, if that point is on a function, then the point b comma a is a point on the inverse function. The x and the y values switch when you find an inverse. Algebraically, an inverse function is a function such that f of f inverse of x is equal to f inverse of f of x, which has to be equal to x. When you do the composition, everything will undo each other and those two functions will reduce out to simply x. Today we're going to look at each of these definitions and see how they apply to specific functions that we have studied already. Here we have a function f of x is equal to the square root of the quantity x minus 1 all minus 4. If we wanted to make a flow chart for this function we would say we start out and the first thing we do is input the x. Once we get the x we're going to subtract 1 from that. Then we're going to take the square root of our answer. Then from that we will subtract 4 and our output will be y. So this is a flowchart diagram for f of x. If we wanted to graph the function, we're going to have a minus 1 on the inside, which will move us 1 to the right, and a minus 4 on the outside, which will move us down 4. To plot the points of a square root function, I use my general shape from my anchor point. The square root of 1 is 1, the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 9 is 3, and I can plot my half a sideways parabola that's been moved 1 to the right and down 4. In number 2, we're supposed to explain why f must input a value of x is greater than or equal to 1 and output a value of y is greater than or equal to negative 4. The input or the x values are the domain and the output or the y values are the range. This should make sense that we have to input a value greater than or equal to 1 because for the input you cannot take the square root of a negative number, so we have to have an x greater than or equal to 1, and for the output the smallest square root is 0, since we're then subtracting 4 from that after we're done, negative 4 is going to be the smallest value for y. So in number three, first we will examine the inverse graphically. On the graph in number one, reflect each point over the line y equals x. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to graph the line y equals x on my graph. Remember the line y equals x is a horizontal or a diagonal line that goes through the origin with a slope of one. Now I need to take each of these points and reflect them over the line. Since this first point that I drew on my, apps, or on my graph was at 1, negative 4, on my inverse graph, I'm going to go 4 to the left and up 1, and my point is going to be at negative 4, 1. The second point I plotted was at 2, negative 3, so on my inverse, I'm going to have the point negative 3, 2. 
In other words, from my anchor point, I went over one, up one in the red function, the original. So on my inverse, I'm going to go up one over one. That means that I also have points here and here. This is the graph of the inverse. I'm showing that with my notation by putting a little negative one in the exponent spot. Number four is asking us for the domain and range of the half parabola that we drew for our inverse function. In this one, for the domain, the x had to be greater than or equal to negative four. And for the range, the y had to be greater than or equal to one. Turn your paper over and fill in the chart for number five, showing the x and y values of the inverse function. Then answer number six, describing the relationship between a function and its inverse based on the table. Reading my values off the graph for my inverse function, my x's were the y's for my original function, and my y's were the x's for my original function. It should make sense that the domain of the original one became the range of the inverse, and the range of the original one became the domain of the inverse. For number six, what happened in the table? I just switched my x and y values. Now we want to look at the inverse algebraically. Since the inverse will undo everything, we will work backwards. In our original function, we had f of x was the square root of x minus 1, all minus 4. And this is the flow chart we made on the first page for f of x. What we are going to do is fill in the boxes going backwards to undo everything we had in the original function. So instead of outputting y is greater than or equal to negative 4, we're going to input an x, and x will be greater than or equal to negative 4. In the next box, we have to undo subtracting 4. How do you undo subtracting 4? You would add 4. For the next box, we have to undo taking the square root. What's the opposite of square rooting? That's to square. In the final box, we have to undo subtracting 1, which would add 1. And then last but not least, our output is y, where if our input had x greater than or equal to 1, our output will have y greater than or equal to 1. So if we're going to read off this chart starting from left to right, we're starting out in the first box, we have an x. We're going to take our x and we're going to add 4 to it. Then I'm going to square that. I'm squaring the whole quantity, so I need to write it in parentheses. Then I'm going to add 1. And finally, my answer is y. If my answer is y, and I wanted to write that in function notation, I would show f inverse of x with the little negative 1 in the exponent. And my inverse is x plus 4, the quantity squared, all plus 1. If you look back at the parabola up on the top of the page, this one right here was basically a U-shape that's been moved four to the left and up one, and then there's the right half of that U. Question number six asks, does the inverse pass the vertical line test? If you remember from Algebra 1, the vertical line test, when we draw a vertical line, it can only hit it once. So the answer to this question is yes, it passes the vertical line test. So that means that yes, your inverse is a function. Uh, number 10 just says to verify that your solution is what we got, so we should be good. Turn the page. Answer question number 11 while you pause the video. In number 11, the original function is a parabola moved 3 to the left, down 4, and stretched vertically by 2. So its domain is all reals, and its range is all reals greater than or equal to negative 4. To graph the inverse of this function, 
I need to reflect each of these points over the line y equals x. So starting with this point, I would move across the line diagonally. When I reflect a point that's on the line of reflection, it stays where it is. This point will reflect down here. This point will reflect. This point will reflect. And what we have is a sideways parabola. For this parabola, the domain is that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 4. And the range would be y is an element of the reals, because from our anchor point, we go up and down forever. Pause the video while you fill in the function chart for number 13 and 12. In the original function, we input our x following order of operations, add 3, square, double, and subtract 4. Our output, y, was always greater than or equal to negative 4. Working backwards, we have to input x greater than or equal to negative 4. The opposite of subtract 4 was add 4. The opposite of times 2 divide by 2. The opposite of squaring is square rooting. Remember, when we square root both sides, we always need a plus or minus. The opposite of plus 3 is subtract 3, and that's going to output our y. Take this information and use it to write the equation of our inverse function. Remember to start at the input and work our way across to the output. When I'm writing this equation of my inverse function, I need to start with my input, which was an x. Then I'm going to add 4 to that. Now I have to divide by 2, and I'm dividing everything I have by 2. Then I have to square root, and I'm square rooting everything I have. Then I have to subtract 3, and I'm subtracting 3 from the entire expression. Now I'm going to write this as y equals, because it says an equation for my inverse. In number 15, we're going to go through the steps for solving to find the inverse algebraically. The first step in finding an inverse algebraically is to switch the x and the y value. So my original equation had a y equals, that switches and becomes x equal. Where my original equation had an x, my new equation is going to have a y. Everything else stays the same. Our new goal is to get y by itself because we like y by itself in a function. The first thing I do following order of operations is get rid of the minus 4 by adding 4 and moving it over to the other side. Then I'd need to get rid of the 2 out in front, which is times 2. To get rid of the 2 out in front, I'm going to divide both sides by 2, which the 2 on the right would reduce out and be gone, and the 2 on the left would be on the bottom of the fraction. To get rid of the square, I'm going to square root. I'm square rooting the entire side, and I need to put plus or minus when I square root the side. Last, I'm going to subtract 3 to get rid of the plus 3. And what you notice is if we isolate y, just like we would algebraically, we're going to get the same inverse as we did in our flowchart. So it asks, how does our answer to number 15 compare to our answer to number 14? It should be the same. So what's another procedure we could do to find an inverse? We could switch x and y and solve for y. In number 17, it asks to go back and look at the graph up above and describe the transformations and what's going on with these two functions. So I brought a little picture of my graph down here, and in the original function, that was my x squared, which was my u shape. Horizontally, I moved 3 left, and vertically, I moved down 4, and I stretched by 2 vertically.
in my inverse function, I move four left if I'm looking at that red sideways parabola, and it's also stretched times two horizontally. And last, the minus three on the end moves down three. So inverses are opposites in every way. The opposite of plus three inside is minus three outside. The opposite of minus four outside is plus four inside. The opposite of times two outside is divide by two inside. The opposite of squaring is square rooting. Inbicits, in, inverses are opposites in every way. Turn the page and make a summary based on what you've learned from this activity. In tables, the X and Y columns switch between a function and its inverse. This also happens point by point with coordinates. In graphs, inverses are a reflection over the line Y equals X, which was the diagonal line. In equations, the inverses have the opposite steps. For example, add three on the inside becomes subtract three on the outside. As far as domain and range goes, when you have a function, its domain becomes the range of the inverse, and the function's range becomes the domain of the inverse. Also, to find an inverse algebraically, we can switch x and y and solve for the new y. That means get the new y by itself. To confirm algebraically that f of x and f inverse of x are inverses, we can also do their composition. So if I show that I plug the inverse into the function, and if I plug the inverse in the function into the inverse, my output will be x. So everything has to undo each other. Here I have two functions, f of x is 2x minus 5, and f inverse is then 1 half x plus 5 halves. To show algebraically that they are inverses by composition, I want to start out and I want to put the inverse inside of the original function. So in the original function, instead of having 2x minus 5, I'm going to take and plug the whole inverse function in for x. When I do that, if I wanted to simplify this, I could distribute my 2, which would give me x plus 5, and then I have the minus 5 that was on the end originally. So last, I would put this together and plus 5 minus 5 undo each other, showing all I have left is x. Then I also want to show that if I plug the original function into the inverse function, everything will drop out. My inverse function was 1 half x plus 5 halves. Instead of putting an x into my inverse function, I'm going to replace it with the entire original function of 2x minus 5. Then to simplify, I would distribute my 1 half to give me 1 half times 2 is just 1x. 1 half times negative 5 is negative 5 halves and then I had the plus 5 halves that was still in the first equation. Finally, to simplify, I would have negative 5 halves plus 5 halves, which would undo each other, and all I have left is x. So now I have done composition both ways. Plug the inverse into the function, plug the function into the inverse, and both everything should drop out and be opposites until we get down to x.